it's starting. starting. So let me just confirm from an outsider <laughs> to make sure that um, they can see us now and then you can uh, go. Okay, so are we live yet? Okay, I think, I think we should be live now. So you can go, Bob. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Herzig. I'm the coordinator of the Mel Lecture Series. And before I introduce this evening's speaker, I want to remind viewers that Mel has ongoing virtual events during the pandemic. Our conversaciones con amigos, our story time, as well as our talks, Googling Merida English Library or Merida English Library Facebook. And we hope you are enjoying our virtual talks this season. And I want to thank Aranza Reynoso, our MEL administrator, and Paola Sanchez, her assistant, for their invaluable assistance uh, with this. Without their help and their expertise, this would not be happening. Um, as many of you know, MEL's fundraising activities have been severely curtailed during the pandemic. So our house and garden tours and our wine tastings have uh, not happened. So Mel instead, we have published our Mel cookbook as our main fundraiser this season. And this book contains over 150 international recipes contributed by Mel supporters. And it can be purchased online for 500 pesos. You can pay with PayPal or a credit card and you can pick it up in Merida um, various places, but the library and the slow food markets, for example. And please remember that even though our talks are free, we need your generous support to keep Mel going. And now to our speaker. Uh, Mariana Cuno holds a PhD in Latin American studies and cultural anthropology from Tulane. Currently she teaches Spanish and mythology at Southeastern Louisiana University. Mariana came to Yucatan in the 1980s, exploring indigenous plants and how they're used for traditional healing. It was while looking for these plants that her guides would recount childhood stories that fascinated her. Having now published a book on traditional Mayan healing, including her own botanical drawings, Mariana is working on another book on tales. And this is Mariana's second talk at Mel. And so I give you Mariana Cuno and many thanks. Well, thank you for the lovely introduction and thank you so much for having me. Um, it is my great pleasure to uh, do another Mel lecture even in this different form and not in person, but uh, we do what we can. Um, I always loved fairy tales and folk tales as a child. So as you said, I started paying more attention to those little bits and pieces that people would tell me as we were collecting plants in Yucatan. And then I started to wonder how much of that stuff was actually written down or how much of it was well known. And I scoured the libraries in Merida to see uh, what was in Spanish because I can't read Mayan. And I found out that pretty much there was a consistent corpus of folk tales that people knew but it had only rarely been in English. So then I embarked on the journey of translation for which I was very unprepared. And I really didn't know uh, how difficult it was to try and find an appropriate voice in that some of the things were you know, told to me in a very offhand fashion by people while we were walking around in the woods. And some of the stories that I looked at were, you know, 100 years old in this very sort of flowery Spanish with a million adjectives. And I didn't know exactly how I was supposed to, you know, what, what, what voice should be telling the story. Uh, anyway, uh, last time uh, I spoke to you guys about uh, stories that featured transformations. And that's a main kind of a topic in uh, Mayan literature, but this time I want to talk about animal stories. And uh, again, some come from uh, 
translated from a written down textbook kind of a thing. Uh, some I took notes in the field, I transcribed them, I edited them, edited, edited them. Uh, so a lot of them are really compilations because I would find multiple stories that would be like the ones that I heard from people. And then I had this job of trying to figure out, okay, you've got six versions of the same story. So how do you just like make one version? And I took a lot of liberties and this was not intended really to be an academic exercise, but really more uh, just for the pleasure of the stories and to give them a wider audience in English. And some of the stories will remind you about Aesop's fables, uh, like the ant and the grasshopper hopper story is kind of about animals, but it also is supposed to teach you that it's wise to be cautious and plan for the future or else. Um, some stories from Yucatan explain why animals and birds look the way they do or why they act the way they do. Um, anyway, I especially like some of the bird stories that you will, you can still find in Engracia de Rosado's volume, uh, which is called Los Pajaros Eran Diferentes Entonces. Um, the weird thing with some of these books that I found is the tangled relationship between, you know, originals and editions. And I have yet to probably never figure all that out. But her book was published. Uh, the one that I work with was published by Maldonado in 2000. And the back cover says the author wrote the original in English in the 1930s, which was then translated into Spanish and published by uh, somebody, uh, Pastor Navarrete in 1938. And then much later after I had been thinking, ooh, I'm translating these into uh, English, isn't this great? Then I found a volume of bird stories in English that dated from 1967. Uh, and that book is Anne La Bastille Bow's uh, Bird Kingdom of the Maya. So I'm not really quite sure what the relationship is, but if you go around the peninsula and you spend time with people, uh, pretty much everybody knows the story of the peacock and how he got his plumage. So uh, I'm gonna just mention some of the other people uh, who, whose versions I looked at. Uh, there's Hermilo Abreu Gomez, and my late great friend Eleuterio Paul Yaf, who told me the story. As you know, birds were not always as they are today. A long time ago, the great spirit got very tired of the squabbling among the birds of the peninsula, and he called an assembly in order to choose who would be capable of governing the others. He wanted to choose a leader that would keep the peace. Each bird wanted to be the chosen one, and each one set out to prove why they would be the best choice. There's no doubt, said Shkokol Che, the nightingale, that the bird with the sweetest voice should be the chosen one. And he stretched out his throat and he demonstrated his most complicated trills and warbles. No contest, said Kutz, the wild turkey. The election will fall to the strongest bird among us. In order to maintain order among the fighters, one needs a strong hand, and in that, there is none that can surpass me. So to, it sounds familiar. And to show off his great strength, he reached out his wings and he broke off a branch of the tree and he was very impressive. Well, nobody is more capable of reigning over the others than I, said the Cardinal, Chak Tsib Tsib. One must look the part to rule successfully. Just one look at me and you will be convinced. And slipping forward, she displayed her regal red feathers. Each bird took turns showing off uh, Zul Kutz, the peacock, and that's a wonderful name because uh, Zul Kutz literally means uh, foreign turkey in Yucatec Maya. Uh, Zul Kutz, the peacock, who had listened patiently to all of this, he didn't even open his beak. He was silent, but he was ambitious, and he was proud of his felt body. But he knew that because he had kind of sparse and unattractive feathers that he was not really very the really the best dressed one compared to the others. Oh no, I will never be picked. If only I had another suit, I think things would be different. He thought about it and then he flew over to his friend Puhui, the night jar. And he says, I've come to make you a proposition. Your plumage is very fine, 
but doesn't it seem you're a little bit too small to be the king of birds? I'm afraid you don't have the grace and elegance that I have. I can't give you my body, but you can give me your feathers, although you would just be alone for the one time and then I'll give them back. So in exchange for the favor, Sul Kutz, the peacock, swore he would share the riches and honor of the kingdom with the nightjar. Nightjar just sat there. And he thought, well, it would be great to have such an important ally as a new king, but he wasn't really sure. And the peacock insisted. Finally, the nightjar was won over and he said, okay. One by one, uh, he was despoiled of his feathers and the peacock went about putting those onto his sleek body. The feathers grew and multiplied. Peacock was delighted with his new suit and his gorgeous long tail. Uh, and he shone like the tropical dawn and he was just so lovely. And with his wings lifted up and his head tipped up into the air, he entered the clearing and his feet were washed and he strutted forward and everyone said, ooh and ah, and uh, some of the envious spectators shook their wings violently with rage. They say some birds fainted. The ugly peacock had become beautiful. Only the great spirit watched the transformation complacently. He called the birds to order and in a high voice he said, all right, you're king of all birds. We mortals do not always understand the choices made by the great spirit. Anyway, once he was proclaimed the king, the peacock forgot all about his promises. Most politicians do this, right? Uh, he enjoyed his powerful position and he never gave the friend that helped him achieve it another thought. Well, one day a group of kindly female birds, maybe we should call them hands, uh, noticed that the night jar was missing and they went to look for him and they started thinking that maybe some shady trick had been played upon him. They looked and looked and they found him huddled naked under a bush and he was shivering with cold. Uh, the birds, the girls, the hens were incensed and they drafted a letter to the great spirit and they called for punishing the peacock and it was signed by all the other birds. The great spirit must have acted because from then on each time the peacock opened his beak up, a really loud grating strident sound came out instead of the beautiful songs that he was used to singing. The other birds laughed and made fun of him. Okay, now if I can truly share my screen, I want to show you a drawing that I did of the peacock. Oops. All right, let's see. Here's the peacock. There he is. So it was my idea to do black and white drawings for all the stories and I've only done a very small number of them. But here is the proud peacock with his stolen feathers. All right. Now, uh, the next story uh, takes up where we left off and it talks about the Puhui, the night jar uh, and why he questions travelers. Again, you know, the stories are kind of connected and it's part of the, I would say, the oral corpus of folktales as well as some of the written ones. After having loaned the untrustworthy peacock his feathers, uh, Puhui, the messenger of the roads, found himself naked. He was still regretting his actions by the edge of the roadway when he heard the approach of other birds. He ran to hide his nudity. Although the sun was high up, poor Puhui sat shivering with cold. Ah, it'll probably just be for a day or two, the peacock told him. And so the innocent night jar waited, believing in his trusting heart that the other one was going to come honor the pack. He waited. He waited some more. He was hungry and he was almost dead from cold. He stayed hidden. He believed his friend was coming, but a week passed and there was no sign and it seemed like forever and he was getting desperate. He couldn't go look for food because he was ashamed that the other birds would see him without his feathers. Under the bushes, the little seeds and insects got scarcer. He got tired of waiting. He ventured out from cover long enough to ask each person who came along the road, Puhui, Puhui, he shouted, which in his language meant, where is he? Where is he? The legend says that long ago in those times when the world was new, the Mayan people and animals all spoke the same language. But at the time this story took place, the Mayan people had already forgotten the language of animals, so they couldn't respond. The night jar, 
crouched unhappily under the leaves of the bush, meditating on vagaries of friendship. Early one morning, he was discovered by that search party of concerned ladybirds. Uh, all the birds were summoned to witness what had happened to the poor nightjar, and each one donated one or two feathers to dress him. Uh, the nightingale, in spite of being poor and humble, gave more feathers than the others, and then intoned a song to raise the spirits of the unfortunate uh, bird. So that is why Puhoi, the messenger of the roads, is dressed in feathers of different kinds and colors. He was still ashamed to wear a suit of clothing that didn't really belong to him, and notwithstanding the passing of time, he remained vigilant in the paths and the roadways, awaiting that ruthless peacock who robbed him of his original plumage. To this day, he runs out anxiously in front of passing travelers, and he shouts in a supplicating voice, Puhoi, Puhoi, but it's all in vain. Poor baby. Okay, I'm gonna share the screen again so I can show you my picture of the night jar, which, oops. Oh, that's certainly not what I wanted to do. Uh-oh, I messed up. There we go. So these are black and white, uh, and this actually is gray ink drawing. Uh, I have these wonderful pens that have shades of gray as well as black and the night jar, I think, is related to a whippoorwill. Okay, so should we do one more uh, birdie one? <laughs> Let's do another bird. Why the owl only comes out at night. Again, uh, this is the usual suspects, the same authors. Uh, also, my friend uh, Don Benjamin Burgos told me a version of this story, and also uh, I found a story in a little book by Jesus Ascorra Alejos. Have you ever noticed that owls uh, are rarely seen during the day? Long ago, when the world was young, the owl could see as well at night as in the daytime. This was a privilege the gods had given to him because of his great love of learning and studying. He spent a lot of time studying, although every once in a while he'd leave his den to enjoy the company of other birds. At the great council of birds, when the peacock was elected king, the owl was designated chief advisor because of his great wisdom. So the birds were having a big party to honor the king, the evil peacock. <laughs> And all the birds were coming to the party, but a special committee was dispatched to get the owl to come too. The owl didn't like going to parties because they were rowdy and birds got drunk and behaved foolishly. So he didn't want to go. He said he had more important things to do. Well, the committee was not surprised, but fearing the wrath of the king, they said, oh, owl, wisest of birds, have you by chance forgotten your duties? As chief advisor, you're supposed to be presiding over the banquet. Well, the owl sighed and he arranged his plumage and he followed the birds into the woods. A strong limb of a gigantic saba tree had been chosen as the site of the banquet. The clay vessels, the oyas containing the food were suspended from smaller branches. The king reserved a place by his side for his chief advisor and as soon as he took his seat, the festivities began. The servant birds served the food in fresh green leaves and before each thirsty guest, they placed rolled flower petals filled with dew. Short time later, all the table companions, with the exception of Owl, were enjoying themselves. Some of the youngsters, especially the chachalacas and the macaws, annoyed the advisor, the Owl, with their yelling, and he began to feel really sorry he had to go to the party. As the sun descended to the horizon, the party got noisier and louder. Wilder, the vulture, Chom, and Sue, the cuckoo, danced wildly to the beat that the woodpeckers pounded out with their strong beaks. Even the king, the peacock, forgetting that he traded his lovely voice for those fancy feathers, he shouted so loudly that even the other wild creatures of the forest fled in fright. The owl got exasperated. He couldn't handle the shouting and the undignified behavior, and he tried to sneak away. But the king noticed, and he said, you get back here. Now the owl obeyed, uh, but he was mad. Uh, he turned his back on the gathering from a high branch. And the king could not really um, tolerate this behavior. So the king said, 
all right, Al, you get down here, you take part in this party. I want to see you dance the harana with everybody else. So the owl was very miserable and clunky. He wasn't a good dancer. He tried to sing and he was humiliated. Um, anyway, he thought that his reputation was ruined. And so he kind of withdrew into his nest. He consulted the sacred books that had been entrusted to his care and he searched those documents with patience. The biggest light, desire of his life was now to find a way to expose the king to the humiliation that had been inflicted upon him. Finally, after many days, the owl found what he was looking for. In the first parchment attached to the third book of life, he read about how the peacock had tricked the messenger of the roads, Puhui, uh, the nightjar, and gained the kingdom after inducing him to give up his feathers. He discovered that the tricky king had never compensated Puhui. Owl dispatched messengers to invite every bird to a great assembly. Then, and only then, did the owl feel happiness once again. The sun was shining its rays when he left the hole that served as his dwelling place. With the roll of papers under one wing and the other lightly extended, he took his spot on a high branch from which he addressed the company. Brothers of the woods, he said, you must know the truth. You must know the truth. You must know the truth, he repeated, opening and shutting his round amber eyes. He tried to read, but although he scanned the parchment, he couldn't for the life of him make out a single word. He realized that his vision was becoming weaker and weaker and weaker until finally the writing was just a blur. He cried out with a shout of desperation. He let the parchment fall. He then discovered the whole truth. Those days he spent hiding inside his hole had made his eyes adjust to the dark and the light of day now blinded him. And that's why Owl rarely comes out during the day. His desire for vengeance to denounce the king was punished by the gods. Two wrongs do not make a right. Okay, I have an owl picture to share with you. Oh no, let's see, here we go. Here's the owl. This is entirely black and white, no gray pen, just black and white. This is probably the, one of the older, one of the first drawings I did for this seemingly endless volume that keeps growing. And then, you know, I'm still so far behind in terms of coming up with illustrations. All right, so let's see. Let's get away from birds just for a minute. I wanna tell you a story about a Kawadi Mundi. Y'all know what those look like? Yes, kind of a raccoon thing. They are uh, pet animals in Yucatan, I think sometimes. Anyway, uh, this is uh, the story about how the Kawadi saved his benefactor. And it's based on a written tale by Evelio Tash Gongara. So the Kawadi is an animal about the size of a dog it's in the raccoon family. It lives in caves and farmers don't like it because it tears up their plantings and it especially likes unripe ears of corn. The coati works at night when the fields are unguarded. It has a snout like a dog and it has pointy teeth, although it's timid and it usually runs away from people. They say that one Sunday afternoon, a farmer went out to his milpa to check on his crops. He went off walking and reached the middle of the cornfield when he heard a weird little sound and he followed it. It sounded like someone or something was breaking corn stalks. He walked quietly towards the sound and he found an ugly skinny kawadi that had become trapped in some brambles and fallen branches. The more the creature struggled, the more entangled it became. The man noted that the animal was in trouble. He took pity on him and he lets the animal go and he says, get on out of my cornfield, dog. just go on out of here. Well, a couple days later, the farmer goes back to his fields and it was at sunset. So he carried a lantern to light his way home. He walked and he walked and on the edge of the woods, he saw another kawaii. The farmer is now kind of annoyed figuring it's the same animal that's been eating up his corn and his squash and he chases him with his dogs. The farmer wasn't exactly watching where he was going though and he burst into a clearing in the woods and realized he was surrounded by hundreds of kawadis. 
To his further surprise, the Ahau, the Lord, the leader, the chief of these animals, an exceptionally large creature that seemed to be glowing from within, addressed his subjects in a human voice asking, is this the one? The farmer was terrified. Every hair on his body stood on end and he trembled. The leader of the Kawadis continued, what did this man come here to do with his dogs? And without waiting for a response, he directed his minions, tie them up. Tomorrow we'll decide the fate. We will teach them a lesson so they never come back to this place. Having said this, he departed with his retinue. The Lord's vassals complied with the orders and then they too departed. Well, the farmer found himself alone and tied to a stake. And he asked himself, what devils made me come here? And he was sitting there contemplating that when a familiar looking Kawadi crept towards him and begged him to be quiet and wait. Shh, when the others are sleeping, I will set you free. I know you really are a good man because you turned me loose when you found me trapped in your fields. I owe you one. The man heaved a sigh of relief. When the leader of the Kawadis and his followers slept, an enormous silence settled over the clearing. The little animal made good on its word and gnawed through the ropes that bound the farmer. As he chewed through the last knot, the Kawadi said, get on out of here and don't you ever come back to this place because this is sacred to us. Because I freed you this time, my debt has been canceled. And if we meet again, I will not recognize you, nor you, me. Seeing himself untied, the man released his faithful, faithful dogs and set off in the direction of the town. Naturally, the story is not just a story told amongst farmers. Many believe it to be true. They say the chief Kawadi and his court meet in their secret circle on full moon nights. Well, I don't know about that, but um, I was kind of disturbed after working on this story to read that when they're groups of Kawadis, they don't include males. <laughs> it's only the, the females and the juveniles that hang around together and the males are off somewhere else. But again, maybe that's too literal a concern for the story. Let's see. Here's one short story about a weasel. Uh, this was based on Abreu Gomez's story, La Comadreja. Once upon a time, an evil man trapped a witch who was rumored to possess a fortune in gold. The man threatened, I'll kill you unless you give me that money that I know you have hidden in a cave. The sorceress swore up and down she had no such treasure. Her captor kept insisting, although the woman said it would be useless to kill her, she was just a poor villager. The bandit, unsure of his best course of action, decided to tie the sorceress up to a tree and he sat himself down on a stone to ponder everything, but his eyelids got heavier and heavier and before too long he fell asleep. That was when the sorceress remembered her friend, the weasel, and she summoned the creature to the place. She did this by magic. It was just by her thoughts. She didn't have to speak out loud. She just thought it. And the little weasel came running. The little animal came and asked, what did the witch want? And she said, just chew through these ropes that bind me with your sharp teeth and free me from this horrible man. But first the clever weasel wanted to know what she would get back in return for doing the favor. The sorceress promised her a brand new suit as the one the animal wore that day seemed a little bit tattered and it wasn't all that flattering. The weasel said, okay, good deal. So she entered the open mouth of the snoring bandit and ate up his heart. Then she jumped out, chewed through the ropes and released the witch. And that is why from then on, the weasel sports a magical suit that changes colors according to the seasons of the year. <laughs> all right. Um, what is that, an ermine? It has white and then it looks brown the rest of the time, I think. I wasn't actually aware that there were weasels in Yucatan. You all can tell me whether that's true. Maybe. All right, one more story then. This is really an old one. Um, it was told to me by my late great uh, Yucatec Mayan language teacher, Don Eluterio Poot Ya. And in it, the tricky rabbit kind of reminds me of Br'er Rabbit stories. 
um, which of course are based on folk tales that crossed the Atlantic with enslaved Africans and then took root in the American South. Now rabbits never seemed like they were very smart to me or very tricky, but I would also note that in classic Mayan artistic traditions, uh, rabbits are scribes and maybe literacy could imply intelligence, maybe. Uh, Margaret Park Redfield, who was the wife of Robert Redfield, the famous anthropologist, uh, recorded a very similar story in the Cuentos section of her uh, 1937 work, which was called The Folk Literature of a Yucatecan Town. So this story is, has been around for a while too. Once upon a time, Rabbit found a young corn plant growing near the entrance to his house. He watered the little plant each day and as it began to head, it occurred to him he should sell his crop. I should tell you that Rabbit was smart, but he was very lazy. Watering the plant was much more work than he was accustomed to doing, but it gave him a good idea, so he set out on a little sales trip. First, Rabbit approached Rooster, and he asked him if he wanted to buy some corn. Rooster was surprised to hear that Rabbit even had a cornfield, but he was ready to purchase corn for his ever-growing family, and the two soon agreed on a price for 20 sacks of corn. Never mind that Rabbit only had one plant. The rooster paid for the corn, and Rabbit told him, come by on Friday and pick it up. Then he went home, and he buried Rooster's money under his heart. Next stop, Rooster calls upon Dog and convinces him to buy some more corn. Dog turns over his money, and Rabbit invites him to come by on Friday to collect the 30 sacks of corn. Rabbit runs home one more time and he buries the money under his heart. Lastly, Rabbit went on to Fox's house. When he answered the door wearing his black mask, uh, Rabbit wanted to know, hey, Fox, you wanna buy some corn? Fox said, yeah, sure. And he too paid Rabbit in advance with the understanding that he'd come get his 40 sacks of corn on the following Friday evening. Rabbit ran home lickety split, and once again, he buried that money under his heart. Friday evening arrived, and Rooster was the first visitor to knock on Rabbit's door. Come in, sir. I've been a little under the weather, so your corn isn't quite ready, said Rabbit, but I've sent my servants to go and get it, so please just sit down and make yourself comfortable. Rooster sat down to wait. Soon they heard another knock on the door, and here came the dog to get his corn. Rabbit, bleh, Rabbit whispered to Rooster that there was a dog at the door and he said, you better go hide behind the kitchen door. So once Rooster was hidden behind the door, Rabbit invites dog to come in, says, make yourself comfortable. The servants must be off dallying somewhere from getting the corn and they, they should be there any second. Just set, set yourself down, make yourself comfortable. So dog figures, all right, I'll wait, no problem. But then there came another knock at the door. Now dog went to hide underneath the kitchen, not underneath, dog went to hide behind the kitchen door too. When Fox entered the house, he followed his nose right into the kitchen and he ate up the rooster in two bites. Then the dog killed the fox who wasn't paying as much attention as he should have done to his surroundings. Just then a hunter came by and rabbit begged him to shoot the rabbit dog that had taken shelter in his home. The hunter shot the dog and that left Rabbit with all the money and he kept a little bit of the corn that he grew to. So he was a tricky fellow. We have a picture of him as well. Uh, and I just completed this drawing the other day. Um, after trying to make a rabbit that looked tricky, that took me a little, uh, uh, quite a number of tries, but, uh, and I was gonna make the whole background filled in with corn, but changed my mind on that. Um, the rabbit is actually modeled after a embroidered rabbit on my daughter's pillow. <laughs> okay. One more, let's do one more very short story. I wasn't sure whether to include this one or not, but let's go ahead. Uh, this was told to me by a friend. 
uh, Don Antonio Coyote Pot told me this story um, near Chichen Itza. It's called The Devil and the Dog. Once upon a time, there was a man, and he was so poor that he was always in a bad mood, and he never missed an occasion to mistreat his dog. The devil, who's everywhere, saw that he could exploit the grudge that the dog must surely feel for his master. So he appeared before the animal and he said, come over here and tell me what's going on with you. I see how sad you look. How could I not? My master beats me whenever he feels like it, replied the dog. I know it's because of his bad feelings. Why don't you abandon him? He's my master. I owe it to him to be faithful. I could help you to escape, said the devil. I would not leave him for anything, said the dog. He will never appreciate your loyalty. Doesn't matter. I will be faithful to him. The devil insisted so much that the dog, in order to get him off his back, finally told him, okay, you've convinced me. What do I have to do? Deliver your soul onto me, said the devil. What do I get in return, asked the hound. Whatever you want. The dog thought for a minute. Then he named the price of his soul. Give me a bone for each hair that I have on my body. I accept. The dog told the devil to start counting. And the devil set out to count the hairs of the dog. But when he got to the tail, the dog started thinking about the loyalty that he owed to his master. And he gave a little jump. And the devil lost count. Why did you move? Asked the devil. I couldn't help it. It's all these fleas. They're eating me up day and night. Start again. A hundred times the devil began the count. And a hundred times he had to stop because the dog would jump. Finally, the devil said, I'm not counting anymore. You fooled me, but you've also given me a lesson. Now I know it's easier to buy the soul of a man than that of a dog. The end. True. <laughs> so um, that's my latest installment of stories. And I would love to answer any questions that you guys might have for me. Um, I would like to uh, see the last two illustrations because you you moved the cursor, but you didn't open up the illustrations for us oh, to no, see. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. Yeah, and they, they're beautiful drawings. Oh, thank you. Here, let's see if we can do this better. Let's see. Share. Okay, so here's Rabbit. I think I am messing up here. This is a rabbit, but that's not what I wanted to do. And the other one was owl, which was from so long ago. So thank you. I, I love your drawings. Oh, thank you. All the detail and everything, as thank well you. as the stories. Well, it's been a bit of a problem because I initially um, submitted the manuscript, which has since grown, but I initially submitted the manuscript to University of New Mexico Press because they published my uh, plant book. Um, but I kind of ran into trouble with them because they wanted the stories to be academic and they wanted, I, I'm not sure, you know, they wanted it to be an ethnography and I kept on saying, well, they're stories. And then some people said, who are you to be able to take stories and you're somebody from outside the culture, what right do you have to retell them? And I thought, well, I don't know. I mean, my dad was a writer and I guess I believe that folk tales are in the public domain and that they are often passed orally from one person to the next and the embroidering along the way is part of the fun. So I haven't exactly found the right place for them. And my friend, Eric, uh, told me, well, you know what, maybe you just don't need an academic press, and maybe that's true. There we go. So I'm not quite sure what the end result will be. 
Um, and then I'm not really sure that they're children's stories per se either. Some of them are pretty gruesome and some of them are actually pretty vulgar. Um, so not the ones from tonight. So it's definitely a challenge. But I thank you so much for listening. It's been my great pleasure to share them with you. Marianne, I have a, I have a question for you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. How widespread, if, if I went on the street and talked to 10 um, Mayan today, and would they, do you think they would know all of these? I mean, are they pretty universal or it depends? Many of them are. I mean, maybe not the devil and his dog. Uh, maybe, well, I mean, that rabbit and his corn one has been around at least, I mean, I know there have been written versions of it since the 1930s. Um, some of the, I mean, I do believe there's a corpus of very well-known stories that, you know, probably any little Mayan kid that you would talk to would be familiar with a fair number of them. Uh, the bird ones are pretty well-known, widespread. Uh, last year, when I was so fortunate as to lecture in person, uh, I talked about the uh, Dwarf of Ushmal story. Oh my gosh, everybody knows that one. Um, there's like 50 million versions of that. Um, and I think that it's interesting that, you know, they're so well known in the peninsula and so not well known outside of it. Hmm. Which I'd like to somehow remedy. Great. Well, you know, in uh, a lot of the world, these animal fables are considered wisdom literature and, and meant to be uh, used by the son of the king. Is there any uh, indication that the Mayan stories are uh, uh, pedagogically correct for young rulers? Not sure. I'm afraid I don't know. Oh, okay. Hi, Mariana. You know, I was just thinking back uh, to some versions of these stories in some ways that I heard as a boy. And uh, uh, I guess many of them were like a cautionary tale of some sort, you know, and uh, probably involving the animals, something a child would rather hear than the guy next door did this and the lady upstairs did that, you know. And uh, it's just kind of sad in a way that uh, I think a lot of that has been lost over time. Uh, you know, as a boy, my dad would read Ernest Thompson Seton to us, and uh, many of his stories dealt with wild animals, and uh, they more or less grasped the courage and the loyalty and, you know, dis different perseverance, you know, that Thompson Seton had seen in the animals, but uh, yeah, he was a New York State guy, an Adirondack guy, uh, but really nice, and the sketches were beautiful, thank you very much. Really, thanks a lot. That's my total pleasure. Yes, and, and uh, best of luck in finding the, the right publisher. <laughs> Thank I'm you. sure you will. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I need a publisher in Yucatan. Oh, yeah, possibly. <laughs> yeah, that was another thought. Maybe yeah. I'll be able to act on it, uh, you know, maybe in the summer. Yeah, after the maybe pandemic. <laughs> virus dies down a little bit. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Maria. Wonderful. Thank you guys for everything. Thank you for having me. It was delightful. And when you do publish next year, your illustrations are part of the book. 100%. Is that wonderful? No, oh, thanks. Well, it, it, it's been an incredibly slow process. I mean, hopefully, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I will just draw a line in the sand and say this is volume one, and whatever is not in there is going to be volume two. And maybe I'll catch up with the illustrations. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Great. Right. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you for joining everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.